everybody. Welcome to Bookends Online Edition, produced by Wadena County Historical Society and Travel and Story Seller, in collaboration with the New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. Bookends is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Next month's Bookends will be held Saturday, March 9th, 2024, at 11.30 a.m., and will feature Michael Schumacher and his biography, Dharma Lion, a story about Allen Ginsberg, a poet of the 60s. This month, Julie Jo Severson will talk about her book, Oldest Twin Cities, A Guide to Historic Treasures, a travelogue of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, and St. Paul. If you have questions for today's author, feel free to put them in the chat. Like other bookends programs, this program will be recorded and made available on our website, www www.wadenacountyhistory.org. Now, let's welcome to Bookends Online Edition, Julie Jo Severson. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon or kind of in between everybody. Great to be here. That's okay. My husband's now letting the dog out of the room here. So he's awake. <laughs> okay. Yep. No problem. Um, thank you for having me here. I think I was here a couple, I was here a couple years ago. Um, talking about my first uh, local guidebook, Secret Twin Cities, a guide to the weird, wonderful, and obscure. Um, today, I'm here to talk about my second one, Oldest Twin Cities, as you said, a guide to historic treasures. Um, Oldest Twin Cities, both the books, they have the same format. They're full of two-page vignettes with photographs that I went out and took myself. And they all they all have one thing in common, they all come with rich backstory and deep local ties. And um, the, it just ranges. It's a wide range of stories um, of some of the most historic sites throughout the metropolitan region, from age-old theaters and eateries to deeply revered sanctuaries and landscapes. And I started writing Oldest Twin Cities about a year after Secret Twin Cities came out. Secret Twin Cities was came out right in the height of the pandemic, 2020, and um, just with all the kind of the loss of community and the shutdowns of um, our, some of our beloved stores and shops and the destruction um, following the, the murder of George Floyd. And I just was feeling kind of a loss of community as we all were during the pandemic and, and I just was feeling a strong need for those places that were persevering and and hanging on that have been with us for a long time and are such a deep part of our fabric. They were kind of providing me with, I don't know, a safe feeling, some continuity that I was that I was craving. And I wanted to focus on on those places that are that were persevered, hung in there and are still around. Um you know, and I'm happy to say all the places in my book, you know, are, are have reopened with one exception, but I knew that when we were going to press that it's reopening wasn't a sure thing. And that is Mickey's Diner in St. Paul it still has never reopened, but I think the building itself is going to be there. I don't know. We'll see. But I felt like no matter what I want, needed Mickey's Diner in this book for posterity, it just I don't know. I felt, I thought, should I leave it out? I wanted all these places to be open, you know, that you could go and visit. I'm like, ah, it was such a hard decision. I'm like, no, nah, I just got to keep Mickey's in there. I got to keep it in there for now. Yeah. So anyway, um, um, for the past 15 years, I've worked, uh, I've been a writer and editor, you know, my entire career um, since my college days. Um, but for the first, the last 15 years, I've worked more as a freelancer to, for flexibility for raising my kids and for helping to care for my parents. Uh, I did yes. that for a long time as minutes. well. Were and you um, yeah. all in the are they talking to me? <laughs> Can't tell. Um, I have an anthology of, of also prior to these books about caring for your parents and your children at the same time as, as a sandwich generation, which I was very much a part of. Uh, my parents both passed away while I was working on these two books, and I dedicated my my acknowledgments. I mentioned them in Oldest Twin Cities because they were played a huge role in instilling a 
a, a deep appreciation that I have for sort of stories that bind generations together and uh, a love for untold gems. You know, we, we, we drive around and my dad was always looking for those hidden, hidden places and quirky, quirky, unknown places. And I don't know, I just grew up, I grew up with that. I wanted that sense of adventure for that because of them. So th these projects were real natural fit for me. Anyway, um, I I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself an expert, a Twin Cities expert or a historian of any kind, but I immersed myself in it while writing these books. And my own local roots run deep. I'm a fourth generation Minnesotan. Uh, I was born in St. Cloud, spent my elementary years in Duluth. And my kind of my first experiences with the Twin Cities started in the started, I always I always say they started while watching Mary Tyler Moore growing up in Duluth. You know, there are nine of us kids and we would all gather around the TV and watch Mary Tyler Moore um big bowls of popcorn with my mom and dad. And I was mesmerized by Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> she was my she was my hero. And I mean I was obsessed with her. I wanted to live in a big Victorian house with a big window like her and have a best friend named Rhoda like her and and grew up to be a journalist like her in, in Minneapolis. To me, Minneapolis, St. Paul seemed like a magical place. And and we would, that's where we would go for our vacations with nine kids. That's we didn't go. <laughs> we went to the Twin Cities for our vacations. We hopped in a couple cars or we had this big pink bus like the Partridge family without the musical talents. We would we would travel to the Twin Cities and stop at Toby's and and you know, Renaissance Festival, Valley Fair, or a lot of things we just had to find free. We'd go walk around Byerly's, the chandeliers and the carpets and the 50 cent ice cream cones, or we'd ride up and down the elevators in the IDS Center. <laughs> I remember running around the skyways. My parents were very creative and finding free things to do. Um, Southdale, um, one of my favorite things was uh, the state fair. My grandpa Irby Herb rode horses there until the day he died. There's a plaque dedicated to him there outside the grandstand. And and then the, the Dayton's, you know, holiday shows. We'd always stand long lines to go see Pippi Longstocking and Cinderella. And, you know, and those characters, by the way, many of them are stored away at the historical Minnesota Historical Society now. So you can go see them there. And, and that mummified monkey they found in in the Dayton's roof. <laughs> That's when they're remodeling. He's there too. Um, that was kind of fun to learn that they're they're all there. Anyway, um, I guess my dream growing up to be a journalist in Minneapolis came true, sort of. There's no Lou Grant, there's no grumpy editor, but it's just me. <laughs> but it kind, kind of came true. Anyway, I'm most of my talk today is actually going to be a slideshow. We're going to go on a zigzag tour of the Twin Cities. And, uh, but first I'm gonna start and, and read you the introduction to all this Twin Cities. It's pretty brief. All right. When many of us are sensing a loss of community in this changing world, it can be good for the soul to experience those local places that transcend generations and offer continuity. An old timey neighborhood deli, a vintage theater, an ancient landscape, a creaky floored general store that sells homemade peach pies at the back counter. Learning about their storied legacies can deepen not only our reverence for bygone days, but also our sense of place in the present. Oldest Twin Cities turns back the pages of time through both legendary and little known treasures that have endured wars, exploitation, the Great Depression, discrimination, fires, urban renewal, an unprecedented pandemic and civil uprising. But the real stories are the people involved who dreamed, hoped, struggled, sacrificed, made memories, and persevered. First, there are Minnesota's Native American residents who've been stewards of this land for thousands of years. Minnesota is a word derived from the Dakota phrase, Minnesota Dakota Makoche, which translates to land where the waters reflect the clouds. Their roots here remain strong, but their history and the tragic erosion of their culture have often been absent from the dominant narrative. Then came the surge of European and American explorers, fur traders, soldiers, pioneers, and colonists in search of land and economic opportunities, followed by waves of immigrants and war refugees from across the globe seeking to make Minnesota their home. 
Now the descendants of all groups carry the torch while navigating unsettling times. Today, over half of Minnesota's population lives in the seven county Twin Cities metropolitan area. At the heart of it are Minneapolis and St. Paul, centered around the confluence of the Mississippi, Minnesota, and St. Croix rivers. It can be a bit of a struggle to describe where the twins begin and end, but they are independent municipalities with defined borders and their own unique characters. St. Paul, our capital city, once a muddy river frontier town that became a transcontinental center for railroading, and for a time a haven for gangsters, maintains a historic ambiance. Meanwhile, Minneapolis, which grew up around St. Anthony Falls while becoming an epicenter for lumber and grain milling, has more of a sprawling big city feel. But wherever you stand in the Twin Cities area, history is resonating. I'm an observer, writer, editor, day tripper, and deeply rooted Minnesotan who believes that when it comes to the well being of a community and its residents, a feeling of connectedness to the places and stories that make our region distinct matters. The 85 vignettes in the pages ahead are mere glimpses of extensive histories. It's the nature of this type of book to provide concise descriptions but brevity can't begin to do these age-old marvels justice. I can only hope that shining a light on these events and places might help rekindle an appreciation for the Twin Cities' rich, complex heritage and the good things going on all around us. All right, I'm gonna share my slideshow now. And we'll do this. Uh... From beginning. Can you all see that and still hear me? Okay. Again, the slideshow will take us on a brief zigzag tour of some of the most historic sites throughout the Twin Cities. It'll mostly focus on oldest Twin Cities there's a couple stories that are closely related, so there'll be a couple of sites from Secret Twin Cities um, in here too, but we're mostly focusing on oldest today. Um, and we'll start south of Mendota Heights on to Fort Snelling. We'll head up the Minneapolis Riverfront and then across the river to St. Paul. As an overall starting point, uh, we'll start at the confluence where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers come together below, below historic Fort Snelling. It's arguably the most significant landscape in Minnesota. To European settlers, this landscape was the center of trade and military authority, but to many Dakota people who call it Bedote, which means a place where two rivers come together, it's the center of the earth. As Gwen Westerman and Bruce White wrote in their book, Minnesota Makoche, the land of the Dakota, this is where their ancestors came from the stars to be on the earth. The Mississippi River was a small tributary 12,000 years ago. It joined the massive glacial river warren not far from the spot. Melting glaciers fed both rivers. The river warren shrank over time and the Minnesota River formed. Today you can visit the place where the rivers join, the confluence at the tip of Wititanka, otherwise known as Pike Island. We'll zoom in on that grassy point at the tip of Pike Island in a few minutes. There are many places in both books that are considered part of the Bedote landscape. One of them is Pilot Knob, located on bluffs across from Fort Snelling in Mendota Heights. This historic bluff top is known to the Dakota as Oye, Oye Hawahe, meaning hill much visited. The Dakota people have been gathering at the site for centuries. It is considered a sacred burial site. Evidence that humans have occupied this land for a long, long time includes 10,000 year old stone and copper tools found by archeologists and the extensive complex of ancient burial mounds that once dotted the landscape. At one of the overlooks, on the bluff is a sculptural work of art by local artist Seitu Jones. It consists of seven blocks of carved stone arranged in a circle. These blocks represent the seven major divisions or council fighters, council fires as they're called of the Dakota nation. In the early 1800s, the elevated terrain that you can see up there on top with a distinguished knob-like formation was used by steamboat pilots 
as they nav navigated their boats upriver since it was easy to pinpoint, thus leading it to be named Pilot Knob. But in 1926, Acacia Cemetery purchased Pilot Knob and started a landscaping project. And as part of that, pro as part of that project, they removed the top 20 feet of the hill, including the knob-like formation for which the hill was named. The site was considered once considered a location for the territorial capital. It was also where the Mendota Treaty of 1851 was signed, ceding 35 million acres of Dakota land to the United States government. After nearly becoming a townhouse development in 2002, Pilot Knob was restored and added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2017. While we're standing on the bluff top, you can see beautiful views of the Twin City skylines and Fort Snelling there. It also provides great opportunities for bird watching within the Mississippi Flyway. And if we turn this image a bit to the right, you'd be able to see the tip of the steeple of the oldest church in Minnesota, known as the Historic Church of St. Peter, which we'll visit now. And there's the Historic Church of St. Peter five miles from Pilot Knob. In this tiny town in Mendota, surrounded by Mendota Heights, Mendota, which used to be called St. Peter, is a name derived from the word bedote. Although Mendota has maybe 200 residents and only a couple stoplights, it seems like it has the highest concentration of historical landmarks in Minnesota. Here's the inside. They still have some services in here, but the majority of activity takes black takes part in the new modern church next door. But this was built in 1853, beautifully restored in the 1970s. It's the only remaining ch church built in the territory before Minnesota became a state. It was where Fort Snelling soldiers often attended services. Antique seating, the original organ, and the original baptismal font you'll find. Here's a photo of that same structure of what it would have looked like 18, what it looked like in 1885. This church was built by Father Augustine Raveau using stone from a nearby quarry. However, there was an even earlier structure. It was a 20 foot by 40 foot log chapel constructed in 1842 by Father Lucien Galtier of France, first Catholic priest to serve Minnesota. And actually the altar that he built for that first church is on display in the modern church next door. On a side note, Father Galtier was also the, the one who saved our capital city from being uh, named Pig's Eye, <laughs> which is a story for, for another day. Um, from St. Peter's Church, then we just head down the hill in the little tiny town of Mendota and we come to the Sibley Historic Site. Beautiful, beautiful grounds. It's home to four of Minnesota's oldest buildings, three of which are open for tours, including the home shown here on the right built for Henry Sibley between 1834 and 1836. Mendota was first a gathering place for Paleo Indians thousands of years ago. Later, it was a site for Euro-American fur traders making their way up the river, including Henry Sibley, a fur trader and army general who, as we all know, went on to become Minnesota's first state governor in 1858. Sibley became operations manager for the American Fur Company at Medota, where he lived and worked in this lime, limestone house built on this lovely landscape across from Fort Snelling. Here is the front side of the house. It's, almost, it's often referred to as the state's oldest private residence. When Henry Sibley moved to St. Paul in 1862, it was used as a school and convent, then as an art studio and school. Eventually, though, it was abandoned and became a lodging place for railroad transients. In 1910, it was restored as a historic site by the St. Paul chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Sibley lived in this home for 28 years. He first lived there as a bachelor, then with a Dakota woman named Red Blanket Woman and their daughter, who is named Wa Kiyi, which means bird, but her Christian birth certificate identifies her as Helen Hastings Sibley. Yeah, I thought, yeah, there's a picture of their daughter together, Hel Hel Helen Hastings Sibley. They, she's known as Minnesota's first daughter. There's a pic of Sibley 
And Sarah Jane, um, after Sibley left Red Blanket Woman, he married Sarah Jane Steele. Together, they had at least nine children, but only four of them survived into adulthood. Sibley did a lot of good for the state, but his role in the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 and its dark aftermath, including the hanging of 38 Dakota men at Mankato, is still one of deep grief and controversy. Although he was known as a friend to the Dakota while he was a fur trader, Sibley was appointed commander of forces by Governor Alexander Ramsey to fight against them. Although my books are tour guides, I definitely don't shy away from mentioning in the books the darker chapters of our heritage, both past and present. If you follow the gravel road behind the, the Sibley Historic Site, many people do not know about this little gem hidden behind there. They'll just look at the Sibley Historic Site and get in their cars and go home. But if you follow the gravel road to the dead end, you'll come across to this tunnel. This is um, the, the Sibley Ferry Stone Arc Bridge, built in 1864. It's the oldest railroad bridge in the entire state. It was first, it was part of the first railroad connection between Minnesota and the East Coast. The tracks above are now abandoned, but the pathway through the tunnel beneath it leads to the Minnesota River Break straight ahead. If you were to walk through the tunnel created by that bridge and follow the trail to the left, you'll be in Fort Snelling State Park where you can access Pike Island located at Bedote. And we'll head over there now. So along that trail, you come to the sign. Uh, the name of the island traces back to US Army Lieutenant Zebulon Pike, who negotiated a controversial treaty in 1805 that led to the Dakota ceding 100,000 acres of their homeland on which to build Fort Snelling. At the halfway mark around Pike Island, um, which is a three mile hiking loop, uh, it, it passes by the Minnesota River on one side, the Mississippi River on the other. And this is the halfway mark where the two rivers converge. This is down below where we saw the aerial at the very beginning of the slideshow. Now we're down right there. Um, this is one of my favorite places to hike in the Twin Cities. This is just another shot when, when the, the water was real low and I was able to walk way out. I love this picture because it shows um, Fort Snelling and then it shows the Sibley historic, or the Sibley house, you know, way back, way back in the day. Pike's Island, I, I, you know, Pike's Island legacy is extremely complex. This is a place of both great pride and despair. And when I'm hiking out there, I, you know, that that's all on my mind. And I pass by other people and wonder if they have any idea of the history of this place. But following the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, Pike Island is where 1,600 Dakota people, mostly women, children, and elders, were crammed together within a wooden stockade during the cold winter months before being forcibly removed from the state. At least 300 died while imprisoned, mostly due to the elements and disease. Exhibits in the Fort Snelling State Park Visitor Center and remembering an honored Dakota memorial shown here at the edge of the parking lot at the park share the cultural significance and history of the sacred park. This might have been included in my Secret Twin Cities slideshow, but I just, I included in both because it's so significant. Above Fort Snelling State Park is historic Fort Snelling, Minnesota's first national historic landmark, where you can travel through 10,000 years of human history, involving native peoples, fur traders, soldiers, veterans, enslaved people, immigrants, and the changing landscape. Originally named Fort St. Anthony, it was completed in 1825 to protect America's interest in the fur trade and renamed in honor of Colonel Josiah Snelling, who supervised the construction. The Round Tower is the fort's oldest structure and the oldest building in the state. The tower has served many purposes over the years, at times as a wash house, a guardhouse, prison room, and coal storage room. 
I was really surprised to learn that in the 1930s, the round tower was converted into a residence with windows for the family of Thomas Markham, who was the electrician for the fort. While living there, his wife ran a beauty shop from it. One of the daughters was quoted in the Star Tribune saying it was big enough that you didn't feel like you were living in a circle. <laughs> it has since been restored to its original form with the rifle slits instead of windows and converted into a museum. Adjacent to Fort Snelling State Park, you'll find a crystal clear treasure known as Coldwater Spring. Spear points and other native artifacts have been found in the vicinity, indicating use of the spring by humans dating back 10 to 12,000 years ago. The main features of Coldwater Spring Park are walking paths through tall, tall prairie grass, the naturally occurring spring, and the historic spring house and reservoir there. This area surrounding the spring served as an important crossroads for fur traders and Native Americans, using both rivers for commerce and travel. During the construction of Fort Snelling, U.S. soldiers camped here, making it the first American settlement in Minnesota. By 1825, construction of the fort had been completed and soldiers had moved from cold water into the fort. But the spring continued to provide water to those at the fort, first via wagons and then via a stone water tower and underground pipes. In the 1880s, the Army built the formal waterworks at the site, including the spring house and reservoir. Here's a view that I took well, right next to the spring house. The property was last home to the Borough of Mines, the Twin Cities Research Center, which shut down in 1995. Today, the National Park Service manages the area as a protected historic site. Nearby the spring, you can stay parked where you are and just walk over to Minneapolis Falls Regional Park, where you'll find these two historic attractions that once used to be the center of a bustling zoo that opened at the park in 1906. And um, these are more a part of Secret Twin Cities, but I just wanted to mention that since we were right next out down to Coldwater Springs, and some of you might not know about Secret Twin Cities, but um, You'll see there, <laughs> out in the field all by its lonesome, the weathered one hand, sta one hand statue, we lost a hand of Henry W. Longfellow in a toga. It was Longfellow's epic poem that made Minnehaha Falls famous and the two thirds replica of Longfellow's yellow home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then just a few steps away from the Longfellow house, you'll find this hugely important historic relic the John H. Stevens House, featured in all the Twin Cities. Unfortunately, last fall, you all heard in the news that it was heavily damaged in a series of fires. I'm hoping it'll be reopened once again as a museum at some point. It's quite a legacy under its roof. This is essentially where the city of Minneapolis was dreamed up, organized, and named. The house was moved several times. In 1896, a campaign to save it began in the pages of the Minneapolis Journal, and I want to read you an excerpt from that. May 28, 1896 was a root and tootin' day for Minneapolis school children. That was the day the Minneapolis Journal rallied an estimated 10,000 squirrely, mostly unchaperoned kids to skip class and hop on a trolley for free to help move an old, rotting timber house six miles across town in a campaign to keep it from getting demolished. Organized into relay teams, the students grabbed onto long ropes attached to horses and followed their orders. Forward march. Hoisted on wheels, the house creaked and groaned as it was pulled to Minnehaha Falls Regional Park, where the kids were rewarded with peanuts, popcorn, and lemonade. This wasn't just any old house. Constructed in 1850 near the present day Minneapolis Post Office, it was the first authorized house built west of the Mississippi River in the area that would become Minneapolis. U.S. Army Colonel John H. Stevens and his wife, Frances Helen Miller, received permission to occupy the, occupy the site, a part of Fort Snelling at the time, in exchange for providing ferry service at St. Anthony Falls. This home is where the city of Minneapolis was named and Hennepin County was organized. It's where the judicial system was established, first elections were held, streets were named, and the first school district was formed. I 
was lucky to, enough to get to explore the place about a month before the fires. The rooms inside are simple, but packed with exhibits and artifacts explaining the key players and events that shaped Minneapolis's earliest years. There are scrapbooks and wonderful photos all over the place, including many images of John Stevens there and his wife. If you can see it. Um, whoops, let's see if I can. Um, they were known as the father and mother of Minneapolis back in the day. The couple initially lived largely alone on the West Bank, alongside Native Americans who occasionally set up camp there, as they had for hundreds of years. As long as we're talking about Minneapolis and in the West Bank, let's over, head over to the Minneapolis Riverfront now, where you'll find many venues and sites featured in both of my books. If I say if cities have a spirit or soul, <laughs> The soul of the Twin Cities is surely felt strongest near the Mississippi River, as well as St. Anthony Falls. I, I took this picture while standing at Water Power Park on the East Bank, looking across the river to the West Bank. The story of Minneapolis, of course, begins at the falls of St. Anthony, the only true waterfall in the Mississippi River. Looking at the falls today, it's hard to imagine it was once 2,700 feet across and 170 feet high and you could hear its roar for miles. Here's a historic picture of the falls, our painting of what it might have looked like around the 1780s. Located in Dakota homeland, St. Anthony Falls, or Owamena, as indigenous people call it, it's been a gathering place for many different people for many different reasons for thousands of years. The waterfall slowly eroded from its original location close to what's now downtown St. Paul. Then it was nearly destroyed in 1869 when a couple of fellas <laughs> tried to build a tunnel beneath it in efforts to get water power, power to Nicollet Island. The tunnel collapsed, turning the riverfront into a series of sinkholes that swallowed entire mills. That's why you see the falls today stabilized with the concrete overflow spillway. I personally think that one of the best things you can do while showing a visitor around the Twin Cities is walk along the two mile heritage trail that surrounds the falls and the riverfront. And so we'll do that now. I often start at First Bridge Park, located along West River Parkway, across the river from the Grain Belt, Grain Belt Beer sign, oddly situated next to a high, Catholic high school. <laughs> so I took this picture while climbing down the stairs from the Hennepin Avenue Bridge that leads to First Bridge Park. And here we are at the bottom of the stairs. First Bridge Park is the site of the first bridge across the Mississippi River anywhere. Interpretive markers and etchings at the park highlight the site's history. The, and this is the first Hennepin Avenue bridge. This first bridge opened in 1855. It was a wooden sus suspension bridge that stretched from the West Bank to Nicollet Island it was considered one of the most elegantly engineered structures in the country at the time. Crossing the bridge required tolls to be paid. A lone pedestrian paid three cents one way, but if the travelers had any horses or mules with them, they'd have to pay 15 cents for each. In contrast, the cost if they were accompanied by a pig or sheep was only two cents. <laughs> that first bridge quickly deteriorated though, and was replaced by a succession of three other bridges including the current Hennepin Avenue Bridge constructed in 1990. Let's see if I, beneath the current bridge, you'll see these old cables and anchors from the bridge's predecessors, discovered during archeological excavations in the 1980s. Head south the block from First Bridge Park, we'll run into one of my favorite places, Mill Ruins Park. The site of the first sawmill and grist mill built by Fort Snelling soldiers in the 1820s and where Minneapolis became the world's flower milling capital by 1880. The park opened a couple decades ago as a great homage to the city's industrial roots. It's a treasure trove of mill ruins that were completely entombed beneath sand and gravel until excavations began. Here's another view from a different angle. You can get right up close to the ruins. At the heart of Mill Ruins Park is Mill City Museum, built into the Jay Goodwall ruins, 
of the Washburn Crosby A Mill. In 1874, Calwalder Washburn, founder of the dynasty that's now Jenner Mills, built the Washburn A Mill. Four years later, a spark ignited airborne flower dust, causing a huge explosion that caused 18 lives and destroyed much of the riverfront area. Two years later, the mill was rebuilt and was soon producing enough to make 12 million loaves of bread in a day. The mill closed in 1965, remaining vacant for a couple of decades. A devastating fire gutted the abandoned mill in 1991. Shortly after that, the Minnesota Historical Society announced plans to build a new, new museum within the ruins. This truly is a great museum, a national historic landmark. You can explore the city's milling history. In February of last year, it was voted the fourth best history museum in the country. You can take a freight elevator ride up to the structure known as the Flower Tower during which machines come back to life. Oops, I did that a little too early, but, and voices of former workers narrate the story of the mill. The museum's light, lighthearted cinematic tour through 400 years of area, the area's history by humorous Kevin Kling is a must see. And as long as you're there, you might as well go right next door, quick to the endless bridge. It's not my book, but I strongly recommend checking this out. Um, you know, a signature feature of the Guthrie Theater. Probably offers the single best view of the Mississippi River anywhere climbing out there. It's free, accessible throughout the week. Time to cross over the Stone Ark Bridge, the second oldest bridge to cross the Mississippi River. Eads Bridge in St. Louis was the first. Here's a historic picture of the bridge. It was built in 1883 by railroad tycoon James J. Hill for the Great Northern Railway. His initials are inscribed on the underside of one of those arches. In 1971, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places. And in 1994, it was converted into a pedestrian and bicycle bridge. After walking across the bridge, we run into historic Main Street, often referred to as the oldest and prettiest street in Minneapolis. It's part of the Marcy Holmes neighborhood, which is well documented as Minneapolis's oldest neighborhood. The neighborhood was originally named the town of St. Anthony Falls in the mid 1850s when it was platted by Franklin Steele, who was actually the brother of Henry Sibley's wife, Sarah Jane Steele. Steele claimed water rights to the falls on the East Bank, and he built a mill and a dam with the help of Ard Godfrey. The area quickly became a hot spot for tourists. You can even take 10 cent torchlight boat rides through caves beneath the street. The town later merged with Minneapolis in 1872. Astor Cafe on the right there is housed inside the oldest masonry building in Minneapolis. There's a front picture of Astor Cafe, originally known as the Upton Building and housed a hardware store where Mr. Pillsbury got his start. It's a candlelit restaurant bar with a European patio and has been referred to as the best place to go on a first date. <laughs> Once you reach the end of Main Street, you can either keep going another block and take a left on Hennepin Avenue Bridge to finish the two mile heritage trail where we first started at First Bridge Park. Or you can take a little detour to Nicolet Island by crossing over the charming historic Merriam Street Bridge, which is a small preserved span of the former Broadway Bridge built in 1887. Immediately after crossing that bridge, you come to Nicollet Island Inn. You'll see it right on your right after crossing the bridge, um, located on the south side of Nicollet Island. This hotel was originally home to the Island Sash and Door Company, one of two industrial structures of the island that survived a fire that swept through the island in Northeast Minneapolis in 1894, started by some boys smoking in a stable. The building at one point served as a Salvation Army men's shelter. Stepping inside, the details are stunning. You'll find an antique glass elevator and a lounge bar with hand-carved maiden heads. They'll even arrange for a horse-drawn carriage to pick you up and take you on a little area tour. On, a, on the pathway next to the 
to the inn, you'll see a replication of a 2000 year old Japanese bell known as the Bell of Two Friends. It was gifted to us by Minneapolis's sister city, Ibaraki. The relationship was formed in 1980 and has grown throughout the years. You can actually ring the bell as you pass beneath it. It is said that every time the bell is rung, two prayers are sent, one for the friendship of the peoples of Minneapolis and Ibaraki and one for world peace. On the north side of the island, as featured in Secret Twin Cities, you'll find trails, bridges, abandoned railroad tracks, and preserved Victorian homes on cobbled streets that make you feel like you're in a time warp. I won't, um, I, I focused on Nicollet Island and Secret Twin Cities, so I'll kind of skip over some of this. Um, at the far north end, you find, you find the bridge that crosses over to Boom Island. So I just love this whole area and how the how all these historic sites are connected by by bridges and parks. Um, but I think we will head over to St. Paul now. Say goodbye to Minneapolis and goodbye to Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> I'm actually there on the far right posing like like my hero. Uh, but anyway, over at St. Paul. Um, to the east side, Yerusa is one of my favorite places. Uh, it's where you can get the biggest meatballs around, corner of the Payne Phelan neighborhood since the Great Depression. The oldest Italian family restaurant. The whole place is like a mini museum, featuring walls with historic photos and dramatic paintings. The restaurant's founder, Francesco Yerusa, was born in a small village south of Rome. He and his wife, Dora, who are parents of 14 children, immigrated to St. Paul in 1904 and opened Yerusos in 1933. 1933. It was actually home to the first bocce ball court in Minnesota, an Italian sport. And as a result, it became a hot spot for the Italian men with names like Moonface and Chili Joe, who climbed up from steep Sweet Hollow, a hidden ravine 120 feet below street level right across the street. Um, as many as you know, I'm sure this became a weird and legendary little neighborhood for the poorest immigrants in St. Paul for nearly a century from the 1860s and to the 1950s. Um, any of you have, have any of you explored Sweet Hollow? Um, this is kind of, I kind of focus on Sweet Hollow in both of my books, but on in different, there's no repeated sites, but for different reasons, but anyway, you you can access it through this historic little tunnel just a few blocks from Eurusos. At one point, it was the only way to access Sweet Hollow, this tunnel. They would arrive on the railroad tracks. Um, they had notes pinned to their shirts to help residents direct them toward the shanties in the hollow where their uh, relatives were living. Others moved into the first vacant shanty they could find, many jobs. Many of them took jobs in the milling and brewing industries at the top of the hill. This is what it used to look like when you would walk through that tunnel, the old shanties. They built outhouses above the creek. Another picture of it. You can see way how it's kind of hidden from above the city. Um, you know, I love some viewed, I wrote, some viewed the Paul as a wretched, wretched slum. Others simply knew it as home, a place where neighbors from different cultures came together to share coffee and bread, smoke pipes under the moon, and fall asleep to the rhythmic rattling of rains. This is what you'd see now as you walk through that tunnel. All cleaned up, now a park. There's a trail that runs through Sweet Hollow. It's the Bruce Fainto Regional Trail. It takes you right to Ham's Brewery. On in one direction, the other direction, it takes you to this amazing place, the Bruce Vainto Nature Sanctuary, um, which I feature in Oldest Twin Cities because it's home to the oldest documented cave in the Midwest. This is a 27 acre oasis bordered by highways and railroads located just east of downtown St. Paul at the base of 450 million year old bluffs. Hard for my brain to wrap around that number. But before this land was desecrated in the 1800s for industrial use, it was used, a, it, it was a vibrant floodplain 
Minnesota's native inhabitants lived and held ceremonies here. Thanks to a Native American-led coalition, it's being cleaned up. Um, but at the very far east end of the sanctuary, tucked into the, the bluffs with fresh water still trickling from it, is a historic cave known as Walk on Tipi to the Dakota people. To many of the rest of us, it's known to Carver, as Carver's Cave, more, with more, more, we're more familiar with that term. But the Dakota's name for it has long been Walkin' Teepee. And this is where Jonathan Carver, a European map maker who lived there with the Dakota people in 1766, wrote about in his journals. He described, described a great cave. He writes about a lake within the cave, an extensive rocket at its entrance, representing ancient stories and spirituality. This is what it looked like in 1875, the cave. But this is what you'll see now. It's across from a creek. You can't get close to it. And it's boarded by a steel gate to protect. It's now on the National Register of Historic Places. They are now building a walk on TP Center at the entrance of the park where you can go and learn more. It should be opening up soon. Um, you can learn more about this really mystifying oasis. And I'll learn more, and I'm very much looking forward to when that, that place opens. One of my favorite places of, of all is the New York Life Eagle, finding it at this little park in the Summit Hill area, um, Summit Overlook Park in the Summit area, Hill neighborhood. It's a one-ton icon of St. Paul's past, I call it. She's digging her talons. If you go up close to it, she's digging her talons into a serpent to protest her, protect her nest of eaglets around it. She originally adorned the three-story entrance to St. Paul's New York Life Insurance Building in downtown St. Paul. But when that building was destroyed in 1967, she was nearly discarded and forgotten until she was moved to the serene spot, 2004. Just a great little place to rest while you're gawking at mansions in the Summit Hill area. And of course, just down the road from the James J. Hill mansion, 36,000 36, square foot gem built in 1891 by James J. Hill, known as the Empire Builder. Not far from there, down the hill to the West 7th neighborhood, you'll find uh, the oldest park or the oldest neighborhood of St. Paul, Irving Park. Small park is hidden, or it's arranged in kind of a square around this historic fountain all under a canopy of ancient oak trees. Um, the land was donated in 1849 by land developer, John Irving. And it quickly became uh, I stately homes and notable families. It was the hot neighborhood, including Alexander Ramsey and his wife, Anna Ramsey. As you know, was Minnesota's first territorial governor and second state governor. But once the Great Depression hit, it all started a slow decline even the original fountain was scrapped for metal, but it has since been replaced. Another picture of Irving Park. The Ramsey home there at 1872 Exchange Street, now a museum. Total of three generations of the Ramsey family lived here until it was donated to the Minnesota Historical Society in the 1960s. And it has just recently reopened since, since the pandemic. The main thoroughfare that runs to the west end is West 7th, also known as Fort Road. And you find a slew of legendary spots along West 7th, including Cassetta, the oldest Italian market in St. Paul. It was once this tiny food market owned by Michael Cassetta, who had a giant heart, never turned anybody away who was hungry. And now that today, owned by the fourth generation, it's a 40,000 square foot, three-story emporium including the Italian food market that started it all. One of my personal places in the, that same neighborhood in the West End is Hope Breakfast Bar, housed inside a 150 year old firehouse. Uh, this is St. Paul's oldest remaining firehouse, originally known as Hope Engine Company Number no. Three, constructed in 1872. D during renovations, the US flag was found on the walls, which is now on display there upstairs. I love this place. There's just so many things to love. On nice days, it's propped open with a fire hydrant, 
Their French toast is whitewashed with cat and candy. St. Paul Mule has a perfect amount of Applejack brandy in it. <laughs> the booths are made from repurposed church pews. They have their original fireman pole and it's drilled right through one of the tables below. And there are hope cards on every table in which you can submit your hopes, dreams, and prayer requests. And owners Brian and Sarah Ingram say that they and their staff read every single one to learn about crises in the community that could benefit from their nonprofit, Give Hope Minnesota, which has been spreading a word of message and hope to rebuild the Twin Cities community, thanks to the wonderful generosity of the owners and their, and their customers. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but anyway, if you took this, um, the bridge um, right in the West End across, this connects the Smith Avenue High Bridge. It connects the west side um, from the west end. You'll cross this bridge and um, get a God's view of the city. <laughs> but on the other side, you find Boca Chica, St. Paul's oldest Mexican restaurant, opened 1964. Inside is just a celebration of the whole fa founding family's heritage right next to Wabasha Street Caves, which you'll read more about in Secret Twin Cities. Um, and across the river from the Vision of Peace statue, which also is included in, in the book. You can read more about. You just get this hushed silence when you see this structure for the first time. 21 story. Anyway, that's just a glimpse of what you'll find and all this Twin Cities, Secret Twin Cities. So we're almost out of time here. If anybody has any questions. You're all muted. But, um, but if anybody, if you don't have any questions, it was uh, fabulous meeting you ladies and having you join me this morning and yeah. Um, so what inspired you to, to do these? I mean, I can kind of see in the presentation what was inspiring, but talk a little bit about what made you think that this would be great to share with all of us. And thank you, by the way, for sharing it, because sure. now I want to go on a trip. Good. To the Good. Cities. Good. I never dreamed I would write local tour books. You know, I, I, I'm part of, um, I'm kind of a longtime member of the Twin Cities Writing Studio which has been a group of us local writers and entrepreneurs who gather every week and write together and brainstorm and, and help each other reach goals and dreams we, you know, we wouldn't think of doing on our own. And um, I was actually approached through an editor I met through the founder of this Twin Cities Writing Studio, um, knew I had an interest in it and, and, I sent them writing samples and they asked me if I would write Secret Twin Cities for them originally because um, they were wanting a book like that. And then about a year later, I'm like, you know, I'd like to write another one with, with more of a historic focus, although they both have a historic focus. And they said, sure. <laughs> and so I got pretty lucky, you know, I didn't have to write query letters to editors and everything. It kind of fell in my lap. So, and it was just a perfect fit and really therapeutic for me during the pandemic, really. Um, especially the second book that we've been a joy. So you took a lot of those pictures during the pandemic? Cause I was just thinking how cool you get to go to all these places in Minnesota and there are no people. <laughs> well, Secret Twin Cities, I wrote, wrote, I wrote and took pictures prior to the pandemic, but unfortunately um, it was published right in March, 2020. <laughs> so then everything shut down for a while, but all this Twin Cities, yes, I. It was during the pandemic, things weren't, some things were open, some weren't, but I, anything I included, I knew that they were gonna reopen. Um, I wanted to make sure that you got a book and these places were reopened that you could go see. So, but yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, it gave me um, a reason to, yeah, get out of the house <laughs> to go take these pictures yeah. for sure during the pandemic. Yeah. It always bothers me that that so many beautiful things are lost to history 
because people are just like, oh, we need the space or we're not using this anymore. And they just seem to have no problem destroying in the name of progress. So oh. it's nice to see that there's still some places left. Yeah, and that's why I learned that there are there really really are so many people committed to to preserving these places. You know, you got some people that could care less. And I would tour buildings where the people who work there have no idea, like the lumber exchange building in Minneapolis. Like they just have no they have no idea what the history of the building they work in, you know, just don't care and don't don't know. But others who are just so deeply dedicated. So that gave me a lot of Op, new renewed optimism i think yeah um at fort schnelling is at pikes island but it kind of looked like not an island now did they like because that the picture of the house the painting of the house and fort schnelling and the island yeah there right. seems like there's more land and less right. water it's, it's yeah it's connected now <laughs> yeah all the islands that were islands are no longer islands it seems like in the twin cities you know i got raspberry island harriet island Nikolai Island. Yeah. No longer true islands. But but this is, you can walk this whole tour if you want. Like you could park in one place and walk most of this, it seemed like. Oh, well, not not all the places at one time. No, but, you know, no. some of, several are grouped, to, are grouped together where you could, you know, and that was neat. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily have a, a real deep knowledge of the geography of these places until I started walking them myself and learning I'm like oh okay I didn't know you could get there from here and so it was really right. really fun yeah yeah I got yeah. a lot of good exercise <laughs> so yeah I just that hope it, good. it inspires people to go see see these places for themselves I always feel um I don't know I feel really good and happy when I have a little adventure to a place that's not the typical places you would go. Um, so it makes me feel good. <laughs> and more well, I worked at, um, yeah, I worked at Love of Dogs in Mendota. Oh. I had no idea I was so close, like in Pilot Knob Road. Yes. I know where that is. Yes. And I had no idea that all that cool stuff was right there. Oh, so. Mendota is just incredible incredibly packed with history and yeah yeah cute yeah. little town yeah because i would just be like oh horrible driving in the winter to get there to teach my class but i'm yeah. like oh but in the summer i have to go back and explore yeah yes definitely need to do that <laughs> yeah yeah, we're also at the bookstore thinking of putting together, um, I'm taking, Gillette has me in this um, inventory management class and they made us come up with a, a, you know, to show that we could do it, to come up with an idea for a display. Mm -hmm. And so I, at this time of year, I'm like, I, I want to stay in my house, but I want to travel. So I'm going to do a travel thing. So this will be an excellent addition to yeah. that table. Cool. Because then people can do, hey, it's, you don't have time to go somewhere really yeah. cool. Well, you already live somewhere really cool. Yep, staycations. I'm I'm big into staycations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't love flying on planes, so <laughs> it works well. And are most me. of these places okay to go with your dog? Because I know you have a dog, and I, I was thinking, <laughs> you know, if people ask, because that might be a fun thing to do, is like um, all the cool places to explore with your dog. Yeah. Because you're like I'll, third book. <laughs> all the, I don't take Oscar, but he's a pain. But no, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, the outside places. And that, and a lot yeah. of, I mean, many spaces are indoor, but a lot of them are outdoor too, which worked really well during the pandemic for people who are social distancing and stuff. So as it turned out, coincidentally, they, they worked well for that, but cool, cool. yeah. Well, does anybody else have any questions? Sometimes people are quiet. That's okay. <laughs> I like to be so I would imagine these are written, these are written a little bit differently than a, than a regular like say a novel like it required I, I don't know um yeah. but I'm kind of guessing because it's not sort of the same thing but it I mean it's still a book but you know is there anything just because they're I I am a storyteller and um yep. and a writer I'm not and so I try to get to the heart of a story and add the fun little quirky details um so it, and humor 
and but they're just short little vignettes yeah but um, yeah can I can only fit so much word count but you know yeah. I like to tell a story so that's what I try to do and help well, you. I kind of like that as guys book because not every I being a history major everywhere I travel we always go to historical sites and not every are all that um informative they don't give you enough information like oh here's this historical site and you're like what now I got to go to like some obscure library into their archives <laughs> to figure out what happened here yeah so it's kind of I like guidebooks that do give you little stories and, yeah. and entice you to want to find more and they're just little nuggets you know for busy people yeah. but but interesting enough to get you more interested so and I you know I've yeah. had a lot of young young adults really really take an interest in these because you know they're bulleted and brief you know but 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 kind of quirky fun but but also father's day and grandpas and grandmas are you know are huge too yeah. um because they have the time and but i don't know so all ages yeah well some of those places seem like a cool place if you were like a young mother with like kids that are old enough to walk or in strollers mm -hmm. or whatever, that a lot of those places would be great and expensive things to do with your children yeah. that are educational and yeah. outdoors and Yeah, and, and a lot of the and... history, a lot of the history about the Native Americans, you know. <clears throat> yeah. So many don't, uh, so many don't know. So many aren't familiar. And I um, was happy to have an opportunity to, to include as much of that as I could in small bits. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like we've reached our time and we want to thank you so much for coming back and joining us again. And we look forward to any future books you do in the future and Great. come back and talk to us about it. And I'm looking forward to selling your book and getting people to come over to the Twin Cities and look at all these places. Great. Thank you. 